Now, I probably don't have to tell you this, but we live in a city that is different. It's different from about everything else out there. It's different from other towns. It's different from other cities. It's different from other societies. Lots of people from outside of New Orleans love the idea of New Orleans, but can't really come to grips. They can't comprehend the possibility of living here full time. Now, other people, though, will deride the city. Some took that so far as to state when Hurricane Katrina hit the city, God did that because of all the shenanigans going on in the French Quarter, not bothering to note that the French Quarter was largely unscathed by the hurricane. Those of us who live here, we hang on the slogans about the city like they're our birthright. The city that care forgot. The big easy. Lazer les bon temps roule. Here's the thing, though. We do care. We care a lot. And the easy times that we have come about only because of the harder times that we encounter, whether it's hard work or sometime enduring tragedies. And we endure all of that because we are absolutely committing to letting the good times roll. So it pains us when this city of ours is, with all of its promise, comes across as underachieving or suffering because whether outsiders know it or not, we, or most of us anyway, are fully and firmly committed to our city. In a lot of ways, we're like Paul, fighting the good fight, keeping the faith, keeping the commitment. And despite all the things that Paul went through, and you know what he went through, I think Paul would be the first to tell you that, like most New Orleanians would say of their existence in the city, that he lived well when he was fighting the fight. The letter we just read from Paul to Timothy was intended to encourage Timothy, Timothy in his faith walk. Should we take that message from Paul as an encouragement? Let me ask it another way. Why, why does it matter to us? Because as Christians, so often we say that the only thing that matters is that we believe in Jesus Christ. And let me say, to be sure, the Scripture says in no uncertain terms that it is always enough to have faith in Jesus, to have faith that he died on the cross for our sins and that he was resurrected three days later. However, having unlimited forgiveness from God does not provide us a license to sin. I think we all agree on that, right? But it also doesn't provide us a license to live a life that's not committed to Jesus, to not live a life like Paul lived. It's very significant for us to understand that when we become Christian, when we are Christians, there should truly be a change within each one of us. If we continue to deliberately misbehave, whether it's just outright sin or just disregarding aggressively living a Christian life, doing that while we intellectually know and understand the blessing of our salvation in Jesus. If we do that, then we need to reassess ourselves. We need to reassess the depth and the quality of our faith. We need to reassess our commitment to Jesus. We say that we believe that Jesus was and is fully committed to us. The question is, are we fully committed to Jesus? As Christians, you know, whether we recognize it or not, every day we're out there on a battlefield. And if we're not fully committed to the cause of Christ, we stand a greater chance of being casualties in that battle instead of the victors. And that pertains not just to winning or losing on major national or world issues, but it comes all the way down to the grassroots, like whether your neighborhood church is going to be successful or not in reaching other people for Jesus, or whether your relationships with your families and your friends are going to bear fruit. Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, the book of Ephesians, and he said this about the fight. He says, our battle is against the spiritual forces of evil. The fight we are fighting as Christians is a spiritual one. And for Paul, when he's writing to Timothy right now, if there was ever going to be a time where the spiritual forces were going to work really, really hard against their efforts, it was right then when the Christian church was just getting started and was still fledgling. But interestingly, you'll read all the scriptures in the New Testament. You'll never find a verse where Paul says, I'm out of here. I quit. 
He never loses his passion for Jesus. He never uses the word like we do, oh, I'm so burned out. You never hear that from Paul because he knew that his source for everything in his ministry came from God and that God was fully committed to him. Nine nations he touched and four mission journeys later, Paul continued to avidly fight the false teachers who were out there. Teaching falsities about Jesus is fascinating. These people would distract people and, and move them away from developing a true faith in Jesus. He continued to fought that, and he, he did it through persecution. He did it through going to prison. And at the time of today's scripture, Paul says, my time has come. My death is upon us. And yet, he's no less committed and no less avid for the cause than when he started. Indeed, Paul is doing what he says. He says, I'm finishing the race. Do we think that that was just stick to on Paul's part? You know, like gumption, blind passion, just hard work for Paul. We know better. We inherently know that's not the case for Paul. We know that Paul's commitment was God to God. And we know it was that commitment that drove Paul's success along with God's commitment back to Paul in response. Because we know lots of people who have that shoulder to the wheel mentality, work hard, and we see people like that who strive hard for success, and by golly, they have some success, and they win some of the battles, but in the end, they often lose the war because the commitment for them is just a one-way commitment. You heard it from our nearly newlyweds moments ago that their commitment is multifaceted and mutual, not just to each other, but to Christ, who's the foundational underpinning for them and for their relationship. That's important that it's not just a statement of it's them against the world. You know, we say that, it's me against the world, or it's us two against the world. But let me ask you a question. If you're up against the whole world like that, how many of those battles are you really going to win alone? And so our hope today for a commitment that Jesus provides to us is a two-way street. Hope that we can be committed to Jesus and a corresponding hope, although indeed it's more than a hope, a corresponding hope of commitment back to us from God. That's more than a hope because we know we have full knowledge of that commitment in the words of Jesus Christ when he made promises to us about salvation through him. And we know this through the writing of Paul, who in the verses that follow immediately after today's scripture, the next two, when he says, I've finished the fight, I've caught the good fight, I'm finishing the race, Paul says this. He says, now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, but not just to me, but also to all of those people who have been longing for his appearing. If Paul was here today, and if he spoke French, he would say, go with God, commit to God, and laissez les bon temps rouler. Let us pray. God, how thin is our commitment to you sometime? We pledge allegiance, and then before we know it, we're, we're off living a life that doesn't reflect you, in which we don't speak about you, in which we don't tell others about you. Lord, help Every, us to make everything we do in each waking moment of our day start with a connection to you, a thought about you, so that the first words on the tip of our tongue in any conversation, in anything we do, Lord, are your words of Scripture and words that you will put on our minds and hearts because we ask you to and open ourselves up to that. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, and our Savior. Amen.